one of the other silver linings that's come out of the pandemic uh, is that we've been forced ahead to really invest in and evaluate ways to communicate with our trading partners um, digitally. Hi there, food enthusiasts. This is Jim Mason, uh, and thank you for tuning in to Future Foodcast, where thought leaders in today's food industry discuss the trends and the technologies that will shape the future of food. Today, we are speaking with Kim Gordon from Slade Gordon. And um, so, Kim, how are you today? I am well, thanks, Jim. Thank you for having me join in. Yeah, so it's great to have you on the show. Um, and you can tell us a little bit about uh, your role at Slade Gordon and uh, a little bit more about the company in the background. If you want to uh, give us some depth on that, I'd appreciate it. Thanks. My pleasure. So I am the proud CEO of Slade Gordon and Company. We are a third generation woman owned family business operating in the seafood industry. Generally speaking, we, you can think of us as a link between fishermen all over the world and the marketplace in North America. How seafood gets from the depths of the world's oceans and our seas and to our dinner table is really a very complex and exciting tale. And managing this process is really what my company does best. The global supply chain is extraordinarily complex. And so our role as a company is to work on behalf of our customers who are distributors, who are chain restaurants, who are supermarkets and, and various others to provide them with the wholesome, safe and sustainable seafood that consumers uh, here in North America demand. I am the fifth generation of Gortons um, in the seafood industry. We like to refer to ourselves as America's original seafood family. And I lead a team of incredibly passionate and dedicated people who uh, work very hard every day to make sure that Americans uh, are able to access a variety of seafood. Yeah, and it sounds, Kim, it's it's a great to hear about the history of the business. So you've been around a while. There was an original mission to this thing. I'm sure it's evolved over time, clearly, uh, to deal with the changes in uh, what the food industry is, what the food supply chain looks like, and even what, in a sense, the fishers are able to produce these days. And, and maybe the um, I won't go that far offline, but I'll say the other thing that's really impacting everybody, besides the obvious changes in legal uh, requirements for a lot of the stuff we all have to comply with. That's a big change, but even bigger, maybe consumer demand and, and uh, trends in that area. You want to give us a little bit of your thoughts on that and how that's shaping the whole supply chain? Sure. I mean, I think so from a trends perspective, uh, during the pandemic, consumers were forced to largely eat at home or at least for at least for some time. And one of the greatest silver linings in that, for at least for our industry, and I think for, for maybe others as well, is that consumers are now more comfortable preparing seafood at home. Uh, they, were, they were forced to cook at home. Uh, people were watching you know, Netflix and TV, and there are, are so many shows uh, now about, about cooking and about food. Prior to the pandemic, roughly two thirds of all seafood was consumed away from home. And while we obviously don't have updated information about that yet, and we won't for a little while, um, I will be shocked if that hasn't started to shift. Um, and the great thing that we've seen is that as restaurants have started to reopen and people are more comfortable dining out again, we are not seeing a decrease in sales at retail or at, at supermarkets, which we had originally predicted. And what that tells me is that we now have total gr um, greater demand for seafood here in the United States. And that is really exciting, uh, particularly for those of us in the seafood industry. Seafood uh, is not or has not been a major staple in the diet of the typical American where it is in many other places in the world. So we are thrilled that coming out of the pandemic, um, we're, we are facing a um, you know, a population that, that is excited about seafood and that wants to eat more seafood. Yeah, and that's, that's a good, oh, I was gonna say, sorry, that, that's a great uh, point about the fact that the demand has gone up and it looks like it's not temporary. Um, so that moves back to the point on the consumer end. Um, do you think that's mostly because of the fact that people maybe see it differently now? Is it viewed maybe as a healthier alternative than some other things? 
I think so. I think um, a lot of it, um, you know, certainly from a, a health and wellness trends perspective, seafood is coming into its prime. Whether you're a baby boomer and you're aging and you're eating it, uh, you know, for health and wellness, or you are uh, younger, I think uh, people in some of the younger generations are are looking for adventure. They're looking for excitement. They're willing to try new things, and so I think that that we've seen a lot of increase um, in interest in the seafood industry because of that uh, and because of the you know, sort of media focus on it and the uh, social media focus on it. So I think there are a number of different things which are really kind of driving the in, in, uh, increased interest in seafood. Cool. Let me loop back a little bit back in the company and talk about, I'll call it the product lines a little bit and help me understand, I think, you have a variety of different types of suppliers in your supply chain. And then at the same time, um, you have a variety of different uh, markets on the other end. In the middle of that, you've got what I call your product lines that you support. And if I'm right, I think a significant portion of what you do is private label, but you also have your own brands. Am I right about that? So maybe you could expand on the product side a little bit and give us some background on that. Sure. So we are somewhat unique in our position in the in the sort of global supply chain in that we carry a very broad line of seafood products, both fresh and frozen. It's really been our model since the start, since my grandfather founded the company. Many of our competitors tend to specialize in one area or another. Some specialize in, in farm salmon, others in shrimp. We certainly have other competitors out there that, that also carry a broad line, but it's something that has really enabled us to develop relationships globally with a multitude of suppliers in many different countries uh, around the world. And what that's done is it gives us tremendous visibility into best practices. Um, and, and obviously without divulging proprietary information, you know, what we see what happens in one plant in one part of the world, and as we work with other suppliers in maybe a completely different part of the world and a completely different product, we're able to help transition some of those best practices and whether they are in processing or food safety or sustainable practices. So that's something on the supply side that I think is important. You know, we used to say that, or I used to say that if it swims someplace in the world and it's sustainable, we carry it. I'm not sure that's entirely true anymore, um, but really we're committed to, to offering a broad line of products. Uh, that is what makes seafood so unique, um, from, particularly from other animal proteins. There are over a hundred different commercial, commercially viable species. And it's really what creates some of the magic and the mystery behind seafood because each one of those species has its own story and its own journey getting from where it's either farmed or where it's harvested to, to our table. And that's just, that's so exciting. So I think that we as a company have really focused on that. And certainly there are times when certain products aren't available, either they're not in season or we're taking a, a conservation approach to, to harvesting them. And so we can then shift to something else. So in terms of the supply, I think that's a little bit of an overview of what we do. And then on the market side, we've also made it our business to serve really both the retail and food service channels and within each multiple segments. So we service companies who manage dining halls at universities and in hospitals. We service chain restaurants. Uh, we service club stores and supermarkets and convenience stores. And again, you know, that really gives us broad access to consumer trends, to uh, trends uh, in food service and in retail. Um, what is, you know, what's changing, what the demand is, what technology is impacting uh, impacting either demand or supply and helps us to continue to evolve, continue to adapt um, in order to be able to uh, continue to provide affordable seafood. Yeah, so I would say uh, you brought up an aspect, I guess, that makes me rethink some things a little bit. So on both the supply side and on the uh, customer side, um, you talked on the supply side about the fact that you're able to see lots of different operations that you work with. Mm -hmm. And you pick up ideas from one that you share with others and stuff. So in effect, I'll say you have an education role that you're fulfilling on that side of the fence. Uh, and as you said, 
good or bad, the, the apothe, as you said, what was it, 100 different commercial varieties of fish? You know, that, that's uh, a rough estimate, yes. I mean, yeah, that's sort like of that. in the but U.S. That, and then you have all of the types of products, uh, sorry, types of I'll call it, uh, solutions you can do with that. I, I can cook it one way, I can put it into a product or whatever. So on the other side of the fence, you have this long breadth of uh, products that are offered. You also pointed out correctly, I've got seasonality on that side. So that tells me that on both your food service channels and also me as a, an end customer, or more my son actually, who's the chef in the family, uh, he needs to understand not only the seasonality of the products, but also in a sense, what can you do with it? So just like you're sharing best practices on the supplier side, you know, it's somehow, I don't know how you uh, call it support that goal, but I, I can see the challenge for all of the outlets, the retailers and the end consumers trying to say, hey, what are the fish out there? How can I use them and all that? So maybe you can help us understand yes. how that kind of message gets out. And it's a, it, that's a really interesting, um, you know, question and ongoing challenge, particularly in an industry as complex as the seafood industry is. I think a big piece of it is, um, is digital communications, to be honest with you. And yeah. one of the other silver linings that's come out of the pandemic uh, is that we've been forced ahead faster than we may have found our way without the pandemic to really invest in and evaluate ways to communicate with our trading partners um, digitally. How do we share information? How do we share information about the product, uh, where it comes from, what its story is, how to prepare it, how to handle it? Um, what are good substitutes, uh, but also information um, about, you know, forecasting. We exist today in a very dysfunctional global supply chain as a result of coming out of the pandemic and, and working with our customers and our suppliers to forecast demand and supply has taken on an entirely new meaning. And so using technology, uh, leveraging uh, what we can in order to share information in a more efficient way, in a more cost-effective way, uh, in a faster way, I think is something that's become really important. And I know we as a company are looking at really how we really solidify our role as almost a hub, not just for seafood, the physical flow of product, but as a hub for information, somewhat as you just described. We we feed information from our suppliers to the market and from the market back to our suppliers. And doing that in, a, in an efficient way, in a way that creates value for the whole supply chain and ultimately leads to um, an enjoyable dining experience for the consumer um, and a profitable business for those participating you know, along the value chain. That's really our goal. Yeah, and you know, it's interesting because you already said you're sharing good ideas or best practices among suppliers. And it's almost like uh, I can think of the UMass dining hall where my son went to school in Amherst and say they do what they do out there to try to be creative to get college students to eat something other than uh, junk food. And they do their best. So I'm sure they're consuming a lot of your product. But that said, you know, they may come up with great recipes as an example for something. And then the reality is a lot of us who are what I call food illiterate, myself included, would go, I don't know, it's fish sticks or nothing, right? And it's really, <laughs> a, it's a bigger story than that. And so the funny part is um, it probably is uh, a, a quote a mission that on your end makes sense to start sharing those kind of cool ideas, right? Across mm -hmm. all of these outlets on the other end. Uh, my son who actually is the smart person in the family and would know how to prepare those recipes would probably learn a lot from stealing some of those UMass recipes, if you will, to have it marketplace. And I think from a customer perspective, it's always nice. Maybe even if you're a chef at UMass, I don't know, to say, hey, I subscribe to the three weekly, you know, seafood recipes that show up in my mailbox every week from, you know, uh, Gordon's, uh, that would be nice. Um, and then, so there's that education mission um, that you talked about. The other thing you were just hitting on, which is the complexity of the supply chain and the forecasting problem is big. So the pandemic hasn't solved that nor has a lot of other things helped solve any of that. It's only made it infinitely worse. And so the challenge then I would assume is it's, you're needing much more current information across your whole network, right? Um, and, and again, this is not like selling shoes um, where it's like sneakers in the summer and boots in the winter. It's a little more complex on the seasonality that you're trying to track on the demand by far. So I can imagine, well, 
I can imagine how depressing it would be to be an IT manager in a company that had that kind of forecasting problem um, where you're responsible to say, hey, give me better data uh, all the time. Why isn't the data good? It's not my fault. Um, so that kind of work is a big, big challenge. And I, I don't know what your thoughts are on how to improve that. I know I'll say as an example, you know, I work for a software company. One of the things we're doing, we've been using blockchain as a way to network um, with, in a sense, trying to connect demand and supply a little bit closer. But whatever it is, it's not just a technology problem. It's also a problem of getting um, both the clients you have as well as your suppliers fully engaged somehow. So connectivity is one issue, you know, to, to pull in that data, make sure the data is right as a base for forecasting, but whatever else you can do to get them uh, you know, call it more actively engaged in your network so that they're giving you updated, uh, I'll call it more current demand. Uh, yeah, I can mm -hmm. think of any industry that always has a problem with the outdated data, but particularly yours now is so sensitive with these supply changes. Uh, supply chain changes. Is there anything, if uh, quote from an operations perspective, on maybe you can share with us a little bit about what you're doing now and what you're thinking about maybe in the future a little bit about how you might network stronger on the supplier side or maybe stronger on the client side? So, I mean, I think that, um, you know, there are a number of things. I think that um, we, there, are, it really comes down to, to, to technology and, yeah. Uh, you mentioned you mentioned blockchain, and I think you know something like blockchain really kind of serves many different masters. I think it serves uh, you know if, uh, as a food safety mechanism, making sure that food is safe, making sure food is you know caught or harvested in a sustainable way. I think it serves a regulatory master, um, and I think just as with sustainability, Sustainability, it means different things to different people. So one of the things we're um, particularly interested in with regard to that is the ability for blockchain to help us track and ultimately decrease food waste. This is, this is mm -hmm. closely connected to obviously to forecasting, right? The, the better we forecast, um, that is a big uh, driver of food waste. Um, and, and I think that, so, all the investment that's going into blockchain and various sort of analogous um, technologies is, I think, uh, all very well intended and, uh, and ultimately has the ability to support a very positive impact. Um, at some point, though, I think it's important um, for those in our industry and, and certainly consumers to understand that there are trade-offs um, between the cost and the benefit of investing in these types of technologies. And we have to be really careful that we don't make seafood unaffordable because that really flies in the face of, of global nutrition. And, um, you know, one of, I think one of our greatest challenges um, in, in general as a, you know, as a uh, citizens of the world is to find a way to balance on this continuum between environmental degradation on one end and global starvation on the other. And basically figuring out how to do that is kind of what I do every day. And so uh, certainly, yeah. you know. And you better not sleep. We kind of need it, you to get back to work, so. <laughs> exactly, yeah. And so, so certainly, you know, uh, uh, technology is going to help us to share more information. Um, we have to be mindful though, how we use it. Um, uh, um, the value, mindful of the value that it's, that it's actually creating and not get too um, far ahead of our headlights. Yeah, actually, that's a huge point that everybody should uh, be very careful of. So I like, uh, if I made that a theme, I'll say you basically said the theme for technology is not just that I want the technology to do something to address a need, but more importantly, that that need has to be value driven. So whatever I invest in, is going to be value driven and I have to be confident that I'm generating high value. Back to your point, it's not going to help a whole lot if we have a phenomenally, uh, I'll call it out of this world technology system and the net result is I now have to pay $100 a pound for a fresh salmon. That would be a tad tough. And <laughs> we'd now in a sense feed nobody on the planet with that kind of a solution. So yeah, that's a really good thought and, and you're right. It's always, it should always be a value driven approach the other thing that ties into that thought you had as well is how do you, um, I'll call it, come up with what I call low risk strategies uh, to drive forward on these technologies. So it's not that the technology exists. Everybody who's a technologist gets excited. Oh, look, 
I can do this now. Well, that's great. But the reality is here's the real world that we operate in. And what are you gonna do for the use case I'm looking at to show me how we can move into that technology at a very low risk? Because I can't afford, to your point, when you're, it's not about the theory. A lot of technologists like me get excited over the theory. The reality is you're running a, a day-to-day operation that to your point has to be safe, has to be cost-effective, has to be there all the time. It doesn't help mm-hmm. me if your business shuts off for a month or something like that. So given the operational requirements you have, in a sense, A, defining a strategy that's gonna be value-driven and B, showing me that it's gonna, in a sense, not uh, add any operational risks are probably top of the list, I would say. And I'm making that up on the fly, obviously, but I assume those are big drivers that hit you in the back every day. You know, they, they are. And, you know, again, we're, you know, we are, my company in particular sits in the middle of the supply chain. So we're kind of getting hit from all angles, from on the supply side, from sort of the market side of things, from the regulatory side of things. Um, and oftentimes, you know, those things are at sometimes opposing, um, yes. but certainly not consistent. And so our, our challenge is to continue to try to bring everybody to the middle to focus on what is most important that various types of you know, uh, investments in efficiency or technology can, can drive. And I think in broad terms, it's really about um, food safety. It's about sustainability. Um, it's about how do we uh, tell the story of where the product comes from. A lot of the discussion today um, tends to, uh, in this technology tends to be around sort of def- playing defense right? Uh, we mm-hmm. want to make sure that, you know, we don't have something bad going on in our supply chain. And, and of right. course, that's really important. I think the flip side of that, though, is, is, and this is what we're focused on, how do we, how do we use the technology to actually tell the story of where the product comes from? People mm-hmm. are really craving, you know, transparency. And that Right. That means a lot of different things to different people. But I think what they really mean when they when people talk about transparency is they want to know that the food that they're eating is authentic. Where does it come from? Who are the people that, that produced it? Um, you know, is it is it safe? Is it was it raised in a sustainable way? Um, right. And so some of these technologies allow us to focus sort of on the good and on the positive, right? not just playing defense for the negative, right? And I think yeah. that any way that we can connect our customers and connect consumers with their food source is going to, I think, make for um, a planet that is more aware of what it takes to, to, to feed, feed the planet. I think it will help in our efforts to... <clears throat> reduce food waste. And I think it also, excuse me, helps to highlight the role that so many men men and women who work to bring this product to our table play in doing that. Well, you're right. So the deal is that um, if you look at the, in a sense, the sources, the origins, the fishermen out there and so on that are producing all this product, in a sense, I'm sure they're all as passionate as your team is about what they're, in a sense, doing uh, to provide good fish, if you will. And so they're passionate. I'm sure they would love to feel that their story is being heard on the other end of that pipeline. And on the reverse of it is, (laughs) where did my fish stick come from? It's probably Jim's problem. My son's problem is where the filet come from. But um, the other end of it, you're right. I think across any industry, um, people are demanding more on the consumer side to know the origin of something. And then the other side of it is when you brought up the regulation aspect, which is important as well, that says, okay, the origin's not enough. Yes, I want to know the origin. I want to know the story of where this came from. Tell me about this boat, you know, that went out. What day was it that, you know, I caught the fish and so on. That's, a, that's an important story to share. Um, the other thing is the concept that you brought up on the regulation piece, because we have tons of regulations already. Uh, I'll, I'll bet if I ask you, are regulations going to decrease in the future? You're probably going to say, I'm pretty confident they won't. They'll only continue <laughs> to grow. Uh, whether they add value or not is a different question, and I'm not sure they always do, unfortunately. 
but we're not going to see lower regulations, unfortunately. So the question is, how do you support regulation requirements without raising, back to your point, the cost of operating and producing this stuff, which is actually a pretty critical thing. Nobody can afford to see the cost of seafood rise by 200% in two years. That, that doesn't work no matter what you're doing. So the, the goal is people have to be able to afford to eat this stuff and you have to figure out a way to deliver this stuff, um, these improvements, I'll say, in that framework. Um, so that's a challenge. But certainly the regulation stuff, one of the nice things is we have the origin story that you said. Everybody on your end needs to know the destination. Who's consuming this stuff? Who's the end consumer, right? It, it, right. it helps you a little bit to know that this distributor bought all of that product. That's great. But where did the distributor sell it to? You need to know where the end uses of this thing are. It's going to help your forecasting as well for the whole supply chain to share that information. So right. the third thing is this piece on the regulation piece. So now we're talking about we're regulating things like food quality, food safety, uh, track and trace, and all of that. So now we're, we're concerned about what I call a chain of custody from the point mm -hmm. where the fish is caught all the way through your plant, your processing, mm -hmm. all the way out the other end to uh, was this fish kept at the right temperature at UMass and all that. So there's that whole chain of custody problem, which is a big thing too. Mm -hmm. Regulations are after that. But to your point, the only good news, I guess, in looking at it is all of these different um, problems that we're trying to provide solutions for. Some of them at least have maybe <clears throat> some common technology that can help a little bit. So it's not all separate solutions. It's gee, if we invest in this, it can help uh, help us with these other challenges as well. So um, yeah. anyway, that's that's sort of a problem space. I think on your end, I'm going to guess you probably have internal systems today that track uh, not only the orders and the demand as, as in the forecasting, as you said, but also the idea that you're I'll put probably networked to some of the suppliers and maybe other ones are in a sense I'll call it not automatically electronically linked in, but they're, you know, whatever, getting orders via email or phone or some other mechanism. So I don't know all of those, but you probably have a different connection to different types of suppliers. Does that make sense? It does. And, and you know, to be honest, um, you know, the, obviously we've invested in and leveraged technology really from an operational perspective to help efficiently, you know, source product and 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 uh, fill orders and it's really the sort of the logistics side of that that the technology supports the most right and and communicating sort of the tactical pieces what you know what do we need to buy what are we paying for when do we need it where do we need it um, I think something that's really um, also important to remember though and it's especially true in our industry given 85% of what what we consume here in the United States for seafood anyway has to be imported based on what we can produce domestically in a sustainable manner, is that behind the food, behind the seafood, our industry is really about people. Mm -hmm. And what, what some people will say is, you know, relationships don't matter anymore or loyalty is dead. And I couldn't disagree more. So much of what we do is still based on developing relationships with people at our suppliers, at our customers, in understanding their business, um, in, in building trust that this is not a zero sum game. I'm not yeah. trying to get a better cost uh, at your expense, but what I am, I'm trying to do is to actually raise the value that everybody um, can share. And so technology can can help with the tactics of things, but it can't fundamentally help with the, the relationships that people develop. And it is so important in our industry. And one of the reasons my company has been around for almost a hundred years is exactly for that reason. It's the relationships that we've developed and particularly during the pandemic when we needed to lean on our suppliers to support us and our customers needed to lean on us to support them. I saw a, a tremendous sort of coming together where there was a feeling that we are all in this together. And it was almost a return to the time my father would describe um, where there was uh, more camaraderie, mm -hmm. um, a, you know, a little bit less infighting where you picked up the phone and you talked to somebody or you went to, you know, better yet, you even you went to meet them. And so I think that, uh, yes, the technology is important to, to make 
the transactions that we manage efficient um, and to help exchange information, but nothing's going to actually replace um, those human interactions that we have, whether that's with our suppliers or our customers, or even, even just as consumers. I mean, at the very heart of food, and I've thought a lot about this, is really community. And mm -hmm. food is, a, is, the, is close to the base of, of Maslow's hierarchy. It's a fundamental human need to have nourishment, but it goes beyond the physical nourishment and it gets into community and joy and happiness and a coming together. And I found that in a world that is now so polarized and so divided um, in yeah. so many different things, food is something that actually brings us together. Uh, we may have our different views on different types of food, but that doesn't matter. It is a unifying force um, to come together, to have a meal, to, to celebrate the food that we're eating, um, to cook together. And so we as a company are really looking at that as, you know, really um, a positive development that's also come out of the, the pandemic um, and, and come out of this time where there is a, just a tremendous amount of sort of global strife is how do we continue to tell the story of food and to use it as a way to kind of unify and bring people together. And that can't be done just with technology. It has yeah. to be done. It has to be done together. Well, and so actually that's a phenomenal point because <laughs> you're right. There's not much lower on the hierarchy than uh, eating. <laughs> Eating and breathing are right there at the bottom of that. Yeah, and, and water sure. and safety, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, and then you're right. The next thing up on the level is, okay, so how do we communicate together? Because that's an, yeah, high, the next stage up is exactly that. And I hadn't thought about that much, but you're right that in a sense, and I can, obviously we can all go through examples, whether it be the UMass dining hall or my job as a house parent for, um, uh, you know, I'll call it at-risk kids kind of a thing. Anytime you have a social eating experience, in fact, I'll tell you, some companies, a few companies I've heard have gone to this weirdo model where I'll call it the top level executives say, hey, I'm just going to ask anybody for lunch next week who's different. And they keep rotating lunch with different people, to your point, for exactly that purpose. We can have all the formal meetings we want about how do we improve inventory control or how do I improve food safety? But it's not the same as, say, sitting down and having lunch with me you know, for an hour and then shifting next week and having lunch with somebody else. You get a completely different perspective. And you're right, in a world that is divided, you build relationships. And whether it's inside the company or, to your point, having lunch with a supplier or a customer, whatever, it's the same process, same thing. And what's so cool about that, I tell my grandkids, I said, look, the dictionary has a lot of words. There's only two that really matter. The secret truth is nobody told you this. There's only two that count. And when it comes down to relationships, the only two that matter are expectations and consequences. And that's it. And that's exactly the kind of, I'll call it um, a baseline that your business was built on. As you talk about building those relationships, it comes out of those two things, setting the correct, honest expectations and then consistently knowing and understanding the consequences and delivering together on those things. And it's that kind of a partnership, as you say, that is the foundation for how good businesses operate, but also how they even learn how to change and adapt. And if they're not doing that, they're probably not, in a sense, learning at the rate they should to adapt well to the market. The fact that you guys have gone through the pandemic, come out the other side, and you're certainly not weaker than you were going in is a credit to something going on there. <laughs> that's correct, whatever it is. Well, uh, and I think that's a very, I think that's a very um, good point. I think uh, the other, the other aspect of it is really about staying true to your, to your values. And um, some of our most important values are really curiosity uh, and closely tied to that is, is humility. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you think you have all the answers, you're not going to be curious. Um, and you're not going to be able to to evolve. And we all got a very healthy dose of um, humility during the pandemic and having to be resourceful and resilient and really demonstrate a tremendous amount of grit um, to be able to, to get through it. And so I think that um, that, you know, kind of that feeling of we're in this together and it's not going to be easy and we're going to talk straight. We're not going to try to sugarcoat things, but we're also going to take the viewpoint that failure is not an option and we are going to get through this one way or another. Um, and we're going to learn from it 
uh, we're going to be better um, for having gone through it, just as you said. Yeah, and, and you're right. The, 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 I think the, the other point you just hit there was it's not me coming up with the best option. It's together coming up with the best option for, the, in a sense, all of us as a group trying to figure those answers out. And that does take a lot of communication across both sides, in your case, suppliers, customers, and even competitors, or say even in the same business, trying to coordinate. So when you look at the supply challenges, you look at the demand challenges and all the variation that happens there, uh, it's like collecting all of that information together and working with all of those, in a sense, groups involved is a big, big deal. So I, I have no idea how that goes forward as an organization model, but certainly you're right. In periods of stress, you know, people will open up and operate differently, which is a good thing. And so then, it, uh, this is a stupid idea. I would say we don't want to have permanent stress or permanent crises going on. We just want to have the net benefits of those working together somehow uh, that become sort of a permanent way of operating as a change. So hopefully that that happens and we don't lose the I'll quote the good parts of what those lessons learned during the pandemic were. So I don't know how we, we institutionalize that, but it would be nice if there was a way to do that for sure. So well, I think it's. Um... I think it's about um, sort of, again, remaining curious and not resting on your laurels. And um, having gone through an incredibly stressful time, I think it, it gave, gave us confidence that, well, if we can get through that, you know, the rest of it yeah. should be easy. Um, and not necessarily easy, but I think that it was, it was also a time of, you know, uh, it was an opportunity. And so we actually, right in the middle of the pandemic, and we sort of got past the initial phases of it and figuring out, you know, making some of the tough decisions and how are we gonna survive this? We actually took the time to stop and do a fair amount of strategic planning. And we, um, we followed a, a strategy called Blue Ocean Strategy, which is really about uh, seeing the market um, through a different lens. And instead of you know, competing in the bloody red ocean, um, how do you look at the market differently? How do you create demand that doesn't exist today? And so we took the time to do that um, because we thought that it was important that this pandemic gave everybody a chance to kind of do a mid-course correction, if you will. And mm -hmm. so we were really excited about that, you know, and continue to be coming out of the pandemic that we actually took the time to do that. Um, instead of just, you know, kind of, you know, paddling like hell, we said, we're gonna have to paddle like hell, but we're also going to stop and take the time and take a couple deep breaths and say, how can we do this better? And, and I'm eternally, um, proud and uh, of my team and grateful that that they were willing to kind of go on that journey with me. Yeah, uh, well, you're right. It's an internal thing, but you're also, I assume, in this process, try, trying to reach out to, in a sense, the business relationships you have and, and, and ask the same questions with them as well. Oh, ab absolutely. And um, even you mentioned earlier competitors. I was in Washington, D.C. last week and um, with a number of my competitors, uh, working together uh, with various uh, entities in our government to help deal with some of the significant logistics challenges that we're facing in importing food and distributing food um, and getting the country open back up again. And it was, you know, it's a great example of, you know, fierce competitors can put all of that aside and come together sort of in a pre-competitive way for a common good. Um, you know, have a meal together, you know, go speak with somebody in the government together, um, and hopefully uh, are able to affect positive change that's going to ultimately benefit everybody. Uh, and, and it wasn't just competitors, it was suppliers, it was customers, and right. uh, was sort of uh, really, really nice to see, you know, all of us come together to, to try to affect change that we also desperately need right now. And it's funny, um, I have to laugh because I would say, uh, the government, particularly the federal government, isn't always at the top of everybody's most favored list or most admired. It doesn't yeah. often get up there. And so the funny part is, if I would say, you're right, if you're not happy with the output, then you've got to rethink the input. And the input couldn't be better, in my opinion, than if you're bringing people from the real world who operate in the real world to say, let us share our story, let us share what's going on. You still may make mistakes in your legislation, which I see every time I read a bill, in my opinion, but that's just my opinion. But the bigger thing is the fact that, in a sense, there is an open door there to get people to come in and say, hey, talk to us about that industry, because we don't understand it. Mm -hmm. um, 
in a sense, you hope the government's very humble, maybe the most humble group of all, because they should be asking everybody, give us, you know, give us your input kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. And the fact mm -hmm. that you're doing that, and not just you and not just your industry, but hopefully all the other industries are lining up the same way to close what I call those gaps, um, so that you're going to see, in a sense, smarter, uh, more thought through, you know, legislation coming out the other end, uh, which sometimes you know, your original point was like, oh, yeah, it's great to have new ideas and new ways of doing things. And oh, by the way, if uh, salmon goes to $300 a pound, uh, I don't know that's going to help the world a lot right now. And so a lot of times you see things that are not what I call uh, practical, if you will, or thoughtful, if you will, as another adjective from the government. And the fact that I'll say not just your team, but the other industries hopefully do a great job of that, trying to close that gap. So that's a big deal for sure. And hopefully that means the legislation is also more responsive, like the Food Safety Modernization Act. Hopefully your I'll call it education efforts have some improvement on the implementation of a lot of those things. So, well, I uh, I'm not going to get too deep into the uh, politics. I think that there are some there is some policy and some legislation that is certainly beneficial and that is going to move us forward in a positive way. Unfortunately, there is still a tremendous lack of coordination, even within our government between agencies, yes. which from my perspective drives a tremendous amount of angst and inefficiency and drives costs up unnecessarily and just a utter lack of of true understanding and research and sharing of information. Um, and so unfortunately, legislation gets written, um, you know, without the benefit of really digging in and really understanding, you know, yes. the inputs and the outputs and, and the, the, the consequences. And so I'm not sure that that has quite changed, but I think there are always little glimmers of hope. I, I think some of the work that our um, administration is going to be doing on our infrastructure, um, on our, in our supply chain, um, not just in the short term to help alleviate some of the stresses, but longer term to help us um, uh, compete more effectively to, to drive costs out of the system. That, that's very encouraging. Um, however, I think we have a long way to go in, in some of the other uh, regulatory um, areas, and it's a, you know, an example of where um, overregulation will drive cost um, and will unfortunately make things um, unaffordable uh, in, uh, in a time where we really can't afford to do that. Yeah, that, great point. And so I like that concept in terms of how um, people evolve to come up with a, a program, a solution, a piece of legislation or whatever. And I, I'll say myself, I'll just confess for myself, but I think we're all guilty at times of being on a team and not mm -hmm. seeing the larger community that we're servicing, right? Mm -hmm. So just like you exist in a company, I might be in your IT department doing something. I'm sitting with my other IT people. We're all talking, we're all sharing, we're all doing the right thing. And yet we're not getting enough input either to the people we're servicing or the people we depend on. Mm -hmm. And so that, and I think it's, maybe it's more glaring when the government makes those mistakes for some reason, but we all make that challenge. And the funny part is um, there are different strategies for how you open communications. When I used to run IT teams, one of the things I used to do was I would usually put a problem out on the table and say, hey, here's a problem that we need to solve for Slade Gordon. And my team would go, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, 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 sure. We're half aware of it, maybe half engaged. And so mm -hmm. I'd say, okay, this is, this is what we want to focus on as a problem statement today. And I'd have people like nodding and some people had ideas. So all I had to do to fix that, to improve the engagement <laughs> was very simply say, and here's my great bad idea of what we're going to do since I haven't heard anything from you. I'd put it out there and they'd go, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard. It's like, oh, great. <laughs> So tell me why is it stupid, Kim? And you had no problem saying, Jim, <laughs> there were things like the Saturday Night Live skit that say, Jim, you're an idiot. You know, this is what's wrong with your stupid <laughs> idea. And I'd say, what's wrong with it, Kim? And you'd say, well, I have no problem telling you, Jim, that number two is the dumbest thing I ever heard. Why, Kim? And you'd say, well, this is why it's dumb. You should do this instead. I'd say, excellent. Anybody else have thoughts on Kim's idea? No, Kim's idea sounds great. Oh, look, what do I see next to step number two? Oh, what do I see? I see Kim's name now. 
oh, how'd that get there? Because it was Kim's great idea. She owns it. She's going to do it. And so in a sense, that, that kind of a more open process, um, instead of the closed processes a lot of us have, is a great way to go, to have that more open, honest, as you say, conversation and not be afraid to be challenged or criticized or whatever in an honest, respectful way. And I, I think we have too much of you know that lack of or fear maybe of communicating on that broader basis, and we just don't do it well. And you're right. The net of it is we come up with solutions that, in a sense, aren't well vetted, aren't really practical, and we haven't done the right homework to validate that we're going to get the outcomes we want, which is a big deal. So that's it. That's well, a and I, I think there are a couple, a couple things that you've gotten into there. I think. You know, one is um, it, it speaks to the importance of um, understanding that you don't always know what you don't know. Right. And so not, you know, you can't believe everything you hear in the news. You can't believe everything you see or hear in social media. You can't believe everything you find when you do a Google search. Um, and that making decisions and moving forward uh, in a knee-jerk way, which is sort of what our society has evolved into, is sort of this instant gratification or knee-jerk reaction, which I think is causing this polarization. It's a dangerous place to be. Um, yeah. And so you, you know, you've talked about the the sort of the need to um, to foster communication and collaboration. I think one of the challenges during the pandemic has been doing that virtually, even if you're face to face on a camera. It, there is something lost there in, um, you know, in not being face to face. So I know we as a company are are, are working to try to figure out how a hybrid model that brings us together in some ways, and that you know sort of allows for greater flexibility in other ways. I think, you know, the other thing that that we focused on as part of our our Blue Ocean strategy work was, um, you know, you. You begin with the end in mind, right? And so mm -hmm. in our in our business, the end in mind is really, well, what is the consumer's experience with our product? Or what is our customer's experience with our company or with our product? And rather than assume we know the answers, um, we are going to go out and we are going to ask the questions. We're going to go out and actually observe people interacting with our product, which was really hard to do during the pandemic. Yes. But you know, through some creativity and dribs and drabs, I think we were able to do it, you know, and to really understand what gets in the way of a chef menuing more seafood or what gets in the way of a supermarket, um, you know, trying new products or what gets in the way of a consumer feeling good about preparing seafood at home and keep asking those questions. And we, you know, you, all of a sudden sort of discover that, you know, some of the information you had may have been right, but, but, but there were things you were completely missing that, that once brought to light, create an opportunity to have a discussion in a way where, you know, nobody kind of had the right answer. So now that we have this information, we can use our collective best thinking to come up with ideas. And I think it's when, as you say, you can foster that environment where there's where brainstorming is not only accepted but expected, um, and there's you know the sort of the notion that no idea is really necessarily a bad idea, but let's just talk about it. Let's let's do this together, and then yes, of course, assign responsibility. But you know, I think our ability to do that, you know, whether it's with our customers or 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 understanding consumer behavior and desires, or even upstream, um, you know, and then bring that back home and, and do it within our organization is something that's been important. Yeah, you hit one more point in there that's actually a, a key one not to lose, which you really talked about, um, which I hadn't brought up, which was that all of that model for change makes sense. We all then take whatever input we have and we come up with a strategy and say, hey, here's a tactical approach, here's a strategic approach or something we wanna do it, go do it, fine. The problem is when you come up with your answer and you hit on this is you said, we gotta go out and talk uh, and find out from our customers, how are they using the product? It's really doing what I call that research step that says, okay, here's Jim's great strategy on how to sell healthier you know, pollock or salmon. 
you actually have to go through and say, okay, that was Jim's strategy. How well is it working with our customers? If it's not working, why is it not working? What's wrong? Mm -hmm. So there's this huge research piece. And all I'll say is since I've been in this future food cast program, what I've seen is there are companies uh, like yours, they're actually doing real honest to goodness, not just casual phone calls. So I talked to Kim and she had a great idea. That's good stuff. But beyond that, going the next step and saying, hey, let's really measure this thing formally and let's invest some time and some money and learn from this as much as we can. So the informal stuff is a, a quote, a great starting point, but some companies will go beyond and say, no, we need to know more. We really can't invest millions in Jim's great idea without doing more verification. Let's spend the time, let's spend the money. And then it even comes back to something like this and say, okay, let's start sharing the ideas in a sense, in a more global sense, and maybe mm -hmm. everybody can learn from them. So that's in a sense, what the rest of us are trying to steal from you today is in effect that kind of knowledge, if you will. But you're right, it's a community problem that we all have. And it's literally, hopefully learning. And I, I can say in this future food cast model, it has been good, but I've picked up a, an idea from packaging here, as you said with your suppliers earlier, that maybe somebody else has that problem and they don't have that solution yet. And so um, in a sense, I think the food casts are good. I think the extension would be to say, you know, is there a way to build not only a, a sort of a better integrated global model for operations that integrates easily, but also maybe a global knowledge base, as you say, that's easier to tap into on top of that. But certainly I think there's a value for this. There's certainly a high value for the kind of relationships you're building, the kind of communication. But I think market research does pay an important part of that as well, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and as you said, it has to guide legislation. So, you know, in the New England fishing industry, as an example, since I've lived here, uh, you and I have both lived in New England for a long time. And I've been away from New England, but I've lived a lot in New England, I should say, over my lifetime. It, I'll go back to the 50s when uh, my, I went out on my grandfather's boat out on Lewis Bay. And uh, I caught, I think it was two cod, but the guy next to me caught 57 cod in about 15 minutes, right? <laughs> you don't catch 57 cod by line in 15 minutes in Lewis Bay anymore. So we went through the whole, what I call fishing industry collapse. Mm -hmm. And then of course, you know, the quotas and all that stuff and trying to build it back up. And one of the things that does show up differently is that to your point, you have not only different types of fish, but also different areas, different fisheries and so on. And mm -hmm. some like the New England one in many ways collapsed from overfishing, it had to come back with regulation and so on. Other areas in a sense have done a better job. I think it looks like of regulating earlier on. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They haven't suffered the kind of collapses because they have a more sustainable model. Is there any ones that you're aware of that are better than others in that sense from a sustainability perspective? So I think there are certainly, um, you know, fisheries both here in the United States and in various places around the world that um, have done very well in terms of engaging in research um, in developing um, sustainable fishing practices and policies and um, you know, utilizing and sharing information so that uh, technology can be developed so that we can um, manage our, our resources in a more sustainable way. Uh, I think that you know, a place like Iceland comes to mind. You know, they, I think, invented seafood sustainability. It is so central to their culture and who they are as a people. Um, that they, you know, they really had to do that. Certainly what they've been able to do, um, you know, in the Pacific Northwest and in Alaska, I think, you know, they, they've just done a phenomenal job of, you know, determining how to, how to manage those fisheries in a sustainable way. But again, I think um, what's important and, and uh, philosophically, this is something I firmly believe in is that um, it's important to kind of meet each, whether it's a fishery or a nation, you know, meet them where they are and do everything we can to help them move along that continuum to more sustainable practices. Certainly at some point, there's a walkaway point, right? But mm -hmm. if, we, if we are too focused on, you know, stringent certifications and, um, and not and not helping some of these countries that may not have the resources, you know, that we have that are that are far behind us. If we don't work to bring them along and show them how to do it and invest with them in, in the skills and the technology, then we are worse off um, because we we are going to need them in the future. So we as a company, and I personally believe that um, we don't abandon companies, suppliers, you know, fisheries. 
um, if they're not necessarily currently meeting where we need to be. Certainly there's a bare minimum, right? There are bare minimum for sustainable practices and certainly for social welfare and for food safety, but we are gonna be better off as a planet if we work together to bring everybody along the continuum. And it's not gonna happen in an even manner. It just, it's not no. possible to do that. Um, so, so I really think that, um, yes, we saw a collapse of fisheries here in, in New England. Um, however, um, because you know we learned from that, we've continued to do a tremendous amount of research. Some of those fisheries are will start to come back and have started yeah. to come back again. And I think, you know, it's you know taking what we learned and hopefully sharing that with you know other um, other fisheries, other um, places in the world that have similar challenges, and hopefully everybody can benefit um, from that. You know, I think that brings up another point in that. Right now in the food industry, and it's been this way for um, for some time. You know, people are really focused on local food and sourcing sourcing right. locally, and I think that's wonderful. Um, and I think it helps tell the story. I think it is um, makes people sort of feel good about investing or giving back to the communities in which they live and work. The other thing that's important to remember, and, and particularly in an industry like the seafood industry, is that you know. There are certain things that we want to eat that we just can't fish here. We just can't grow here, right? Like I love bananas, but I'm not going to be able to buy them in Massachusetts or that were right. grown in Massachusetts, at least not right now. And so, so we as an industry are you know, continually challenged with this notion that, you know, imports are bad. Um, well, not necessarily, you know. Right much, uh, if not close to, you know, just such a high percent of what we import is, is not bad at all. It's just simply that our own domestic fisheries can only sustainably support 10 to 15% of the demand. So in right. order to feed people with wholesome, nutritious, safe seafood, we've got to go elsewhere. It doesn't mean that we're sourcing it from places that aren't sustainably managing things. Um, so I think, you know, Wanting that adventure, I think that's where transparency um, can come in. If we can tell the story of the fishermen in Iceland, if we can tell the story of the fishermen in Indonesia, if we can tell the story of the, um, the salmon farmer in Chile, um, maybe that makes it feel a little bit less foreign. Uh, yeah. It makes it feel a little bit more authentic. Um, but it's not a bad thing that we have to import this food. Um, it's, it's, I think it's a good thing. And I, unfortunately, I think the, you know, the media um, and just sort of overall sentiment right now for a variety of reasons is sort of that imports is bad. And I'm hoping that we can try to find a way to shift <laughs> right. that. Right, everybody who's not from here is a bad person. You're right, it's right. not really a, a healthy exactly. attitude in general for anything. And it doesn't drive all of us forward for sure. And the other thing that you did before you, moved over there, I think the other point you made that was really also nice and proper is the idea that it's good to have regulation, but it's not that you don't have regulation, especially economically, you're saying it's really the right idea. It comes down more toward the, how do you enforce those regulations? That's what right. you're hitting on very nicely. And the right idea is like, look, you're, you're not up to standard. We changed the standards. Um, so we're here to help you figure out how we can take your situation and move you to become compliant with the new standards. So we're working with you, not trying to beat you up or shut you down, so to speak. And so, yeah, you're right. There is always that, as you said, the baseline. So if my restaurant's a disaster, the health department should shut me down. But the point of it is the health department also should be trying to help me open up again and say, hey, Jim, here's your five big violations. Let's work with you on these things. We'll get you to a point you're open and we'll continue to help you, in a sense, move up the safety chain, if you will, to the right levels. And that's a, an intelligent approach, not only toward enforcement, but as you say, expanding the market for all of us so that in a sense we do have, in the case of fish, you know, more healthy fisheries around the world, more supply and that kind of a thing, which really is a big problem today for sure. So anyway, I've, I've taken more time than I should have. Um, I apologize for the fact that um, I did, but I'll say it's been great to learn about Slade Gordon, what your company is, where you came from, what you're doing moving forward in the industry, and then a lot of your views on how to make that work better. So I really appreciate the time you spent with us today. Before I wrap up, any last thoughts on your end? 
Well, I appreciate the chance to, to talk with you today. I've also learned some things and to share um, my experience and, and some of my hopes for, for our industry and as part of the greater food industry in general. Um, I think that, you know, we, we just need to look towards the future with optimism. Um, there are a lot of things wrong with the world. There's a lot of things wrong in our industry, but I think if we take a glasses half full mindset rather than a glasses half empty mindset, I think we're all gonna be better off in the long run. So I appreciate the chance to speak with you today, Jim. Great, thanks. Actually, my thought on that is I, I like the fact that the glass is also refillable. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> thanks for listening to Future Foodcasts. Future Foodcast is powered by Farm to Plate, the leading food blockchain platform. Subscribe on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts to stay up to date with the very latest innovations in the food industry.